Mark, if the Fed missed its window, as you allege, how does it correct course now without further throwing every asset class into turmoil? Well, the problem is that they should have raised rates, in my view, in 2011 already, or never lowered them to such a low level. Now, the problem is this, that the global economy is slowing down uh, remarkably, uh, especially coming as a result of the slowdown in China. Uh, it's spread to other emerging economies. Then we have weakness in the euro and in the Japanese yen, which reduces global GDP in U.S. dollar terms. And that lowers demand for goods from around the world. In other words, world trade is going down. And so the U.S. is obviously also affected. Right. And in this situation, it would be very difficult to raise interest rates at the present time. Which is where they are right now. I want to read to you something that Ben Bernanke wrote in the Wall Street Journal today. Uh, he talked about how the Fed saved the economy. He said, if there is a problem with inflation, it isn't the one expected by the Fed's critics, who repeatedly predicted the Fed's policies would lead to high inflation, if not hyperinflation, a collapsing dollar and surging commodity prices. He says none of that has happened. Now, in the deflation versus inflation battle, Mark, I know that you say both sides are right, just at different times. What would be the trigger to signal the onset of hyperinflation then? Well, first of all, we have to define inflation correctly. Uh, inflation is basically an increase in the quantity of money and of credit, and everything else are symptoms of inflation. So inflation can lead to rising commodity prices, rising wages, uh, rising asset prices, rising home prices. And in the last 20, 30 years, we had, because of the opening of China and other emerging economies, basically a disinflationary consumer price environment. It's not that they have gone down, but it was disinflationary. And we had huge asset inflation that have created now a stock market bubble, already in 99, 2000, another one in 2007, and now again, and a bond market bubble, an art market bubble, <laughs> and a high-end property market bubble. Mark, I feel like if you had listened to the Fed critics over the last years, you'd, uh, some of them you'd be hoarding canned goods and ammo and using dollars as toilet paper, but none of those have proven to be a particularly good idea. When's it going to switch? What specifically is going to make it happen so that all of these Fed critic, you know, the, the, everything actually comes true? What, what needs to, when is this going to happen and why? Well, <laughs> I'd like to say this. We have uh, depreciation in the purchasing power of paper money. So if you look at uh, the Fed fund rate went to almost zero in December 2008. So we're essentially soon reaching seven years of near zero interest rates. If you held your money on deposit during that time, basically you lost purchasing power because everything is more expensive today than it was at that time. So the purchasing power of money has diminished, and it has also diminished in other countries, but even more so uh, in other countries than in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And Mark, that kind of brings us naturally uh, to commodities. In particular, I'm taking a look at Glencore. If you take a look inside my Bloomberg terminal, I'm looking at the implied volatility of Glencore. Uh, that white line is one month, that orange line is three months, and that green line is six months. I bring this up, Mark, because it shows that the bearishness in the stock and the volatility is expected to persist for a while. Where does this show that we are in the commodity cycle? Well, that's a very interesting question. And the issue with cycles is you're never 100% sure that you are at the top of a cycle or at the bottom of a cycle. My sense is that some commodities are approaching major lows, but could they stay low for an extended period of time? Yes, given my global economic outlook, 
that may be the case. Mark, when we do get an increase in prices for those who are still hell bent on expecting all this easy monetary policy to lead to a hyperinflation scenario, what might it look like and where will we see it first? Well, my sense is that the signal for investors to lose confidence in money, in paper money, will be a strong rise in the value of precious metals, gold, silver, platinum. That will be the first signal. Now, the industrial commodity complex may bottom out if my forecast about weakness in the Chinese economy persisting for quite some time proves to be wrong. But so far, the evidence is that Chinese growth has slowed down considerably and that growth around the world is disappointing. And that's why I feel that the Fed, as the futures market implies, is unlikely to mm -hmm. raise uh -huh. rates for a long time. Uh, Mark, I know that you've been calling for a global market crash next year in 2016. We've talked about what the triggers. Can you quantify what that crash would look like? I mean, are we looking at a 30% decline in the S&P? What, what, what can you quantify for us? Well, the last significant correction was in 2011 when the S&P dropped 21 percent. We had a meaningful correction or decline in many shares already, many stocks, especially economic sensitive stocks, uh, semiconductor stocks and so forth, are down more than 20 percent from their recent highs. So I think that the market may not crash right away, but it's possible that it will, but that it will enter a longer term period of unattractiveness mm -hmm. and where right. prices may actually go lower and significantly lower. We could have a decline like 73, 74, which was a sliding a slope of hope where the market kept on going up and then there were rallies and they went down again and so forth. Or it could be like 87, where at some point we have a very significant correction. Well, Mark, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. Good to see you.